Heath is our guest preacher for today. Yes, you can give him a round of applause. <laughs> I will ignore the fact that you've never applauded me when I've come up, but it's completely fine. <laughs> I know I'm also trying to grow a beard, but that's the best I can do. Okay. So I know that some of you have not met Heath before, so I just want to introduce him to you. Um, Heath is part of, as you, some, as you know, we're a network of neighborhood churches. Cre Heath is part of our East Van Church, Christ City East Van, and he also works on the downtown east side. So Heath, could you just tell us a bit more about yourself and what do you do on the downtown east side? I think my uh, official title is Urban Chaplain. That's just a fancy thing I made up myself. What that means is that I have the privilege of walking along guys who are in addiction, helping them in recovery. Um, I work and partner with an organization called Jacob's Well. It means I get to hang around, drink lots of coffee, hear lots of crazy conspiracy theories, and somehow insert the gospel of Jesus into those equations. So it's, it's a joy uh, for me to be able to do that. So yeah, I, I work and I pastor at Christ City East Vancouver, but I also live uh, on the same block as UGM, Union Gospel Mission, and I get the privilege of serving on the downtown east side. It's a joy. Can I just pray for you and your yeah. ministry now, please? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Heath and his ministry at Christ City East Van and what's, what, what you are doing in that church with Jake and the rest of the team. And Lord God, we also thank you for Heath and his, his heart for the downtown east side and how you've been using him to do so many things. Would you use him to bring gospel restoration to, to those who need it? Would you have uh, people who to come alongside him to serve that, that area as well. Lord, we thank you for his ministry and pray that you continue to bless the work of his hands and we pray that you will bless, bless his, his lips today as he brings your word to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Heath will be here after the gathering. If you want to find out more about what he's doing or you just want to hear more crazy stories, Heath will be here or you can email him, Heath at ChristCityChurch.ca yes. and he would love to connect with you in that way. Could you please stand for the reading of God's word? Today's scripture reading comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 47. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the, on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, losing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of all that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, 
Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children, and for all that who are far off, everyone who in the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all of the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You may be seated. Well, congratulations. You've just survived your first sermon of the day. And now we will get into the second one. Uh, before this becomes a train wreck, I'm going to open in prayer. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it has power. We thank you for this, this story and Peter's message and, and the glimpse that we can have of the early church. So I pray that you would open our eyes, you'd open our ears, and that you'd fill us anew with your spirit today. In your name I pray. Amen. Since the last time you've seen me, it was probably three or four years ago, I, I had a mohawk then. I know. As you can see, it's been a while. And since COVID, I've become one with my inner grandpa uh, because my daughter got married and I had a grandkid since the, I've seen you last. So there's something quite interesting about holding a brand new baby, uh, contemplating the marvel of new birth, and contemplating your own mortality at the same time. So it's pretty cool. But before we go there, I just wanted to say it is so good for me to be back here. It is a real joy. And also, we've scraped at the bottom of the barrel, so that's why you get me. No, I'm just kidding. Have you ever, I know we all watch TV, have you ever watched a TV show or a movie, and it starts and you're like, wait a minute, like, like what's going on? You know, the previous episode, uh, the guy is doing something, but now like we're, we're midstream, it's like your favorite character is now tied to a chair, being tortured, and you're left wondering, what is going on? You're flabbergasted. It's like, did I miss something? You know, you pause it, you stop, you go back. No, okay, I'm on the right episode. And then you get this screen that says, 24 hours earlier, right? That's just, this is kind of what we've walked into this morning. See, before we can address what Peter says in our text, in his sermon commenting on events that we haven't even looked at yet, we have to go, okay, 24 hours earlier. Actually, it's more like a few hours earlier. So to help us in this, uh, our outline this morning will be super duper simple. What's the context we're walking in and into? What does is, what is Peter's sermon actually say? And what are the implications for us, not only for the church in Jerusalem, but also for us now 2,000 years later? So John last week left us off with these words in chapter 1, uh, verses 4 and 5 of the book of Acts. And it says, And while staying with them, he ordered them, this is Jesus speaking, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So Jesus, in a weird event, ascends into the clouds, and we pick up this story in chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they're waiting in Jerusalem as ordered. And then something that only can be described as crazy, as miraculous, this thing occurs. Wind fills the entire room, and what appears as tongues of fire comes and rests upon them. And so this ragtag group of roughly 120 Jesus followers, empowered by these strange events, fill the city first thing in the morning, and they're proclaiming the glory of God in multiple languages. See, it was the Feast of Weeks, which is essentially 50 days after the Passover, a week of weeks. 
But the beautiful thing of it is, the, the ironic thing of it is, is they were there, everyone in the city was to celebrate the, and commemorate the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. So the text says that there was every nation under heaven. So you can read the list there in verses 9 and 10. And it's, it's basically everything from Arabia to Rome and there and back again. So you have a diverse group of Jewish people and converts to Judaism all gathered in Jerusalem. And they were astonished. Because, well, can you think about it? So many people from so many different places all hearing the mighty works of God proclaimed in their own language. This is not a miracle of hearing. This is a miracle of speech. Now, if, we, if we're honest with ourselves, if we come up for air out of our Christian experience and our subculture, or maybe you're new to faith, you have to admit this is a weird story, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's weird. We can acknowledge that. You know, if you've been in the church since antiquity, like I have, and my beard testifies to that, We've probably read this a thousand times, and we probably even memorized it. I went to Bible school, and this is the first text that I was forced to memorize, which is a pretty good text, actually. You see, our familiarity with this story and this text, it's numbed our wonder. It's novocained our sheer awe and the the beauty of this and the weirdness and the scope of this and this amazing significance of tongues of fire coming upon people. In fact, these events are so inexplicable that the people in the city, some of them, how are wondering, how did this group of Galileans, how are, are they speaking in other languages, because, or if it's just maybe gibberish, they thought that these people were on a bender, like last night where I live. Like there was lots of people on a bender last night, and I heard it. They thought this group of people were totally wasted. So as we interact this morning afresh, the question isn't, what do we do with the weirdness? The question isn't, what does this mean? But the question, the real question that we have to ask are, what are these events meant to show us? What do these events show us? Now, Jordan Peterson, in his podcast uh, called The Psychological Significance of the Biblical Narrative, that's a mouthful. It's an interesting thing. I don't want to make anything more than that. But he states in that podcast that the Bible is the most hyperlinked document in all of history. Now, whether you believe the veracity of that claim, we have to acknowledge that that the Bible as a whole and the meta narrative from Genesis to Revelation, it actually is interlaced with so much symbolism that we have to observe and ask the question, what does this show us? See, you have to realize, whether you understand it or not, the whole world right now is caught in the gravitational pull of these events here that we read this morning. We are in orbit and we are sucked in because this is so significant. So what does this text show us today? Might I suggest it's something very profoundly significant. So maybe you've read this before. Maybe it's your first time reading this, but you have to wonder, okay, what's with the tongues? What's with the fire? What does this meant to, what is this meant to show us? So what we're going to do is we're going to dip back into the Old Testament. So ready? Buckle up your seatbelts. Put your tray in the upright position, and we're going to go back to an interesting story in in Exodus chapter 3. It's another weird fire encounter. So you've got Moses. He's a Jewish dude. Uh, He's part of an enslaved race of people, and he's living in Egypt. And so he's he's actually killed a guy, so he's fled into the desert. So he's like in the backwater of all backwaters. He's like herding sheep on Tatooine in a galaxy far, far away. So he comes across this bush, and it's on fire but it's not being consumed. You're probably thinking, oh, that's pretty weird. So if it can't get any stranger, as he approaches, the fire speaks and it says, hey, don't get any closer because this ground is holy ground. The very presence of God. The fire calls out to Moses and he instructs Moses to go speak to the Pharaoh to deliver them from slavery. See, what we can't miss in this story is the raw holiness of God, his righteousness, the very presence of God, deliverance, salvation, rescue, all of that is is pictured, is portrayed in this fire that speaks to Moses. Let's do one more for fun. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 40. So this enslaved people, Moses is obedient, and we can read the story in Exodus, which is pretty cool. You should read it after church. And you can... uh, you, we get to Exodus 40. So they're at, they've been rescued. They've come out of, the, out of the 
the Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, they're at Mount Sinai, and there's a whole plethora of things that happen there. And at Exodus 40, God instructs the people of Israel to construct a tabernacle, a tent. And this is what we get right at the very end of Exodus. See, God wanted them to build this tent so that it would symbolize his presence, his being with them as the God who was with them. And we read this in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38, we read this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. And here we go. Listen carefully. For the cloud of the Lord was in the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of the whole house of Israel throughout all of their journeys. The presence of God, the glory of God, was in the cloud by day and fire by night. Now, I'll spare you the adult ADHD tangent into what the cloud metaphor, because it's really cool, so search it up later. Oh, it's a good one, though. Our purposes this morning, though, from everything from Moses to Elijah ascending into heaven, Fire was meant to symbolize power, the raw power, the raw holiness, the righteousness of God, his very presence. Like I said earlier, you don't have to believe Jordan Peterson because most of us, you shouldn't believe Jordan Peterson in a lot of things. But what you have to do is see and understand God's use of fire in the Old Testament. Have your eyes open to see the use and the significance of tongues of fire here at Pentecost. Luke shows us something extremely profound. The same powerful God who was personally active in the time of Moses, delivering and rescuing a people for himself. In this event, this same God is right here, right now, giving his presence, his raw holiness, his presence to us by his spirit so that every people under heaven could have the opportunity to be saved. This is not a one-off event that's weird. This This is in context and in continuity with all of Scripture. See, when we see this continuity, we can then move to our second point and actually address what Peter has to tell the crowd. Aside from refuting the claim of drunkenness, our text this morning, Peter actually kind of strings together three Old Testament uh, quotes to make one succinct point. And that point has implications for the Jewish context in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and also for us. So, beginning with verse 14, let's read. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And give ears to my words, for these people are not drunk as you suppose, and it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Peter get up, gets up and he essentially says, Look guys, we're not loaded, we're not drunk, it's only nine in the morning, give us a break. Something profound is happening here. Something that you've been expecting, that you've been waiting for for hundreds upon hundreds of years through the prophet Joel. This is actually what's going on right now. And then he quotes, he quotes Joel. So I'll read the quote because it's significant. And in the last days, starting at verse 17, in the last days it shall, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, there's a lot going on here. There's lots of like eschatological things. But for our purposes this morning, what Peter shows us, that what happened earlier that morning was a direct fulfillment of what the prophet Joel prophesied a long time ago, that the, the Spirit of God himself would be poured out on all of mankind, breaking down age, gender, and socioeconomic barriers. The same presence of God in fire, acting and delivering the people of Israel from the slavery in Moses' time is the same God by tongues of fire is what Joel looks forward to. And P- 
Peter says this time, it's that this is fulfilled. This is the time. This is now. Pay attention. Now, this isn't some sort of weird localized event to Jerusalem, but it's actually a call for all to call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Now, one theologian states that uh, this event, uh, Pentecost, is actually the climax of Jewish salvation history. Interesting, interesting premise. But for the, for this morning, kind of close your eyes for a second, and just imagine you being part of the throng, part of the group of people. Place yourself and grapple with what Peter asserts here. Seriously, ask the question, how is this possible? How is this possible? How is this the climax of our, our Jewish salvation history? Uh, I think we're still missing part of the story. So Peter continues with his speech. Good thing for us. In verse 22, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. See, he's, he summarizes here. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and you killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Oh, wow. How is this possible, Christ City? Oh, the resurrection of the crucified Jesus, that's how. The outpouring of the Spirit is according to the definite plan of God wrought by a crucified and resurrected Christ. Peter quotes David then from Psalm chapter 60, Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. And he says, look, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand and I am not shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter doubled down, doubles down here, and he states that David was actually not talking about himself. In fact, I actually say he's buried over there. He's buried over there. Peter then says in 31 to 33, he says, Look, he foresaw David and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, of that we all are witnesses. He's saying, I can testify to that. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Jesus was crucified. Jesus was resurrected. And this is the event. This is what's happening. Peter links the outpouring of the Spirit to the power of a resurrected Jesus. But he continues. And he says, not only is Jesus resurrected, but he ascended. This is what John spoke about last week. He ascended and he is reigning. He is at the right hand of God. Hebrews, we, you looked at months ago or so, that Jesus is actually interceding for us. And this is something that David in all his greatness never did. Why? Because he's buried right over there. Peter quotes again then, Psalm 110 verse 1. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What Peter does, he ties a big bow around this. And with the mic drop of all mic drops, he says to the whole crowd that this Jesus, whom you all crucified, is both Lord. And this is the very name of God. He is both Lord and he is Christ. He is Lord and he is Christ. He is the God of all power, all glory. The one who he's come into the tabernacle. The one who delivers and saves his people. He is also the promised Messiah, the anointed one who rescues his people. This, this Jesus, by the definite plan of God, through his crucifixion, through his resurrection and his ascension, his enthronement. Oh, he is at the right hand of God. It is through this power that the Spirit is poured out on all flesh. That's the mic drop of all mic drops. It's because Jesus was resurrected and ascended that we can actually see who he really is. We can actually see who he really is, Lord and Christ, the one worthy of all praise. So if this is what Peter is showing us, 
then what is our appropriate response, Christ City? If Jesus is Lord, and if Jesus is Christ, through whom the very presence of God is made manifest to not only the Jewish context, but to us as well, what is our response? What is our response? Well, let's listen to what the crowd says. Now, when they heard this, this is 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. And then with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received were baptized, and they were out of 3,000 souls. That's a huge number. When faced with horrific things, when we say, brothers, what shall we do? And this is like brothers and sisters. It's not like a male-centric thing. It isn't, well, maybe we should see a counselor and revisit our childhood trauma. No. It's repentance and confession. This siren call of repentance for the forgiveness of sin and confessing that Jesus is Lord and is Christ has, and, and with that, coinciding the promised reception of the Holy Spirit, with that, that has been the hallmark of Christianity. In every decade, in every century, in every theological deconstruction crisis, every culture, every continent that has been, it has been proclaimed in up until now. Think about that. Peter's promise is for us today, a people and a culture, as he said, that are far off. This promise is just for us as it was for Jerusalem. Now, if you walked into here this morning thinking, hmm, I wonder what Christianity is all about. There you go. See, you and I are counted among the lawless people. We are among the throng. We are the ones who killed the Lord and Christ. And we are confronted with the same questions. Brothers and sisters, what shall we do? Christ City, what shall we do? We'll hear fresh again the words of Peter. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for your forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children. You hear that? The promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. Let that wash over you. Let that fester in your brain. We do not have to be enslaved to our own autonomy. We can receive the power of the Spirit. We can be made new by the one who is Lord in Christ. His name is Jesus. Now, let me tell you, brass tacks, I've been testing this reality on the downtown east side for the last two years. It sounds stupid, but I've had to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in the last two years. No brainer, huh? See, as we transition to our, our final point, listen to the words of theologian Ben Witherington as he comments on the promise of the work of the Spirit in all who believe. Throughout Acts, the presence of the Spirit is seen as the distinguishing mark of Christianity. It is what makes a person Christian. Acts 20.21 20, indicates that for the giving of the Spirit is not just for ecstatic speech or gifts because it enables one to confess the Lord's name from the heart and be saved in the first place. The Spirit, then, is the sine qua non for being a Christian, not merely a means by which one gets a spiritual booster shot subsequent to conversion. So what are the implications of the presence of the Spirit in the life of those who believe? What do we do with this? What do we do with this? Well, we're going to look at the next bit of five verses. Now, I have to acknowledge, if you dig in deep into these verses, truckloads of missiological textbooks, church planting self-help guides, uh, devotionals on kinonia, you know, even monastic rules, ideological treatises, they've all been written about these next five verses. It's a staggering fact. In fact, you could actually fill a trucker convoy all the way to Ottawa with all the books that are written. Okay. Bad joke, I know. Okay, you're still awake. That's a good thing. But once again, we have to, we have to deal with this. 
The question is, isn't, is this a, you know, a prescriptive text? This is, is it a descriptive text? Is this a blueprint? Is this a manual for action in Christian service and community? Is this a proof text for socialism or anarchism? The real question is the same as the one I asked earlier is what is Luke trying to show us here? What is Luke trying to show us here? So let that question foster and fester in your cerebral cortex as we read this text. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and they were belong- their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So this group of newly formed people, this is the new birth of a church, empowered by the Spirit, they, they met together and they were taught by the apostles. They met regularly for social interaction. They met together around the communion table for worship. They met together for prayer. They practiced radical hospitality. They cared for those in need. They lived sacrificially towards others. The result of which were signs, wonders, and awe upon all, resulting in favor of not only those outside the group, but within themselves. And people were added daily to their numbers. So I have a question. Wasn't this how how the people of God were supposed to act? As good followers of the law of Moses, wasn't this the kind of thing that you were supposed to do anyway? Think about it. If the sum of the law and the prophets, as stated by Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, is is this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. If that's true, shouldn't they have been doing that anyway? My hypothesis is this. The outpouring of the Spirit on this new church tangibly empowered them to actually and freely do what they were supposed to do all along. A movement of the Spirit reflecting the glory of the Lord, expanding outward to encompass all of mankind. Now, some of you might remember, some of you are not, don't worry, we'll get to there, but a couple of summers ago, we did a sermon series on the book of Proverbs. And there was a concept concerning righteousness and wisdom in that, and it it stuck in my brain. And I actually haven't been able to shake this concept since then. In fact, it's pretty much what I've tried to do on the downtown east side in the last two years. All of my actions have been around this axiom right here. Bruce Waltke, he's a theologian, he says this. He says, righteousness in the book of Proverbs is equivalent to the Mosaic teaching to love your neighbor. And then here it is. The wicked advantage themselves by disadvantaging others, but the righteous disadvantage themselves to advantage others. I think this is what Luke is trying to show us here. The very truth at play in this Christian community, freed from wickedness and foolishness through the work of Jesus, this new community assumes a righteousness that's not their own, not by their own making, but it's by the Spirit of God, and they can actually be free to love their neighbors, their friends, and those who are far off. They can actually disadvantage themselves for the sake of the other. Luke shows them, shows us rather that life in the Spirit frees us from being enslaved in wickedness, chained by our need and our compulsion and our, and our desire to advantage ourselves by disadvantaging others. I just watched the House of Gucci last night. Whew. That, that's, that's, yeah, now you'd have some more clarity on what I, yeah, anyway. This is this play of play. Business, you are advantaging yourself by disadvantaging others. What it's saying here is by the power of the Spirit, we can actually live and breathe the Spirit of God in us, and we can actually be disadvantaged and help others and actually live out this command. The work of Jesus by his Spirit frees us from foolishness and wickedness in Pro- the Proverbs speaks of. 
Christ City, as we close, we are confronted by two questions. Two questions. First one is, what do we do with Jesus? Jesus has, has confronted everyone since he came on this earth. What do we do with the one proclaimed as Lord in Christ? Will we walk away? Will we say, yeah, forget about it? Or will we double down and by sheer will and determination kind of like continue on with status quo with our own meritocracy? I got this, I got this. Or will we like the crowd and say, what do we do? Repent and be baptized and surrender. But the second question we have to ask is, not only as individuals, but as a church, in our culture, in our time, empowered by the Spirit, this flame of God, how can we be righteous? How can we disadvantage ourselves to advantage those around us? What would our ministries look like? What would our, our thought life look like? What would our actions in our businesses and our communities look like? What would it do if we actually lived this? How would it deal? How would I deal with my irritating neighbor who drinks beer, throws it out, and it lands on my um, balcony every day? You see, this week I've had a hard week. As I wrote this sermon, I've had a person die. I've had two people I've had to deal with suicidal ideation. I've had a person relapse into addiction. I've had to mediate pretty feisty internal interpersonal conflict. And I've had a very, very good friend betray me acutely. In a very real way, I've had to grapple with this question right now in my own soul today. How do I respond? Do I respond in wickedness? Or do I respond in righteousness empowered by the Spirit? So, Christ City, how do you respond? Let's pray. God, we come before you confessing that we read these words and acts and we are we're confounded by them and we don't know what to do with them and we don't see your spirit seemingly act like it did then. But Lord, help us to op open our eyes to see that you are at work. You are powerful. You are just as powerful then as you are now and you are at work. Lord, I thank you for my friend who a month ago was an atheist and now believes in you because your spirit is active and it's powerful. Lord, I, I praise you and I pray that you would fill us anew, that you'd fill us with your spirit, that we would walk out of here, change people, that we would live our lives in your spirit for the benefit of others. In this I pray, amen. Please stand as we respond.